All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Joshua Tucker, and I'm very excited to be re-presenting my JailbreakCon presentation. Uh, for those of you that don't know, um, I did present JailbreakCon this past week, and for some reason, the first half of my talk was not recorded, so I couldn't let that be, so I am re-recording it, and I'm going to be submitting it to Steve, or I hate snow, to splice together and be put into the full video, so huge thanks to him. So without further ado, let's get started. So as I mentioned, my name is Josh, and I am really excited to be able to talk about what I want to talk about today. So without further ado, let's get started. So to begin, I'll just tell a little bit about myself so you have some context. Uh, first of all, uh, I am considered, say, an interaction slash user experience designer here in the community. I have worked on a number of projects, including Callbar, Abstergo, Emblem, Crescent, Merge, Reveal, and numerous others, including helping companies, say, uh, like Intelliborn on Intelliscreen X and Messages Plus and stuff like that. Um, I also had the pleasure of writing for a little bit for Mama Eye, which I was really stoked to meet Kyle Matthews, who's the founder of Mama Eye at JailbreakCon this past week. I also was an editor at Engadget for a while, and I am very excited to, to announce that I will be graduating this semester from Stack State University. I'm a business student. Uh, concentration in entrepreneurship, and I'm really stoked to be finally done with school and off into, quote, the real world. And then also, last but not least, uh, those of you that know me very well, I am definitely a very crazy guy, and so I am known to do the unexpected. So today what I'm going to be talking to you guys about is a topic that I like to call from idea to reality. And basically, this is just a compilation of 10 tips to help anybody that's got an idea to take that idea and to make it into something, to take a project and see it through all the way to completion. And I think this topic is really important, especially in the Jailbreak community, because we have so much opportunity to really shape and change the way iOS works in a number of ways. And there are a lot of people out there that have some really cool ideas, I'm sure, but just don't know about, you know, how, how do I go to the next step? How do I take what I have in my head and make it into something that people can use, including you know the person that has the idea. So this presentation is really just kind of a reminder for many of us, uh, just some really good things to do in order to see a project through and a project that's successful. So the first thing I want to start off by saying that's really, really important when you are looking to take an idea to reality is to ensure that you are writing your ideas down. Now this might seem really obvious, write your stuff down. But for someone like me who literally cannot turn his brain off, it's very difficult to continually remember what I'm thinking about. So that's really helpful for me because instead of having to remember the ideas and using that brain power to remember the ideas, I can actually use that brain power to expand on my ideas. So basically, you will never forget your ideas if you find some way to write them down, whether it's on paper or on your computer or something like that, write them down because then you can use that space in your brain in order to expand your on your idea and make it even better. And as it says on the slide, it's really good for reference obviously later because you might not pursue say idea right now, but it's just good. Write it down and then you don't have to worry about it. And the one thing to remember is that this stage of writing your ideas down, this is a brainstorm session. So don't be trying to repress things that you think might be stupid or not be a good idea. You'd be very surprised by the things that you can recover from old ideas to, to make new ideas better or to even have new ideas altogether. And uh, the example that I'm presenting here where this totally came into play was when Andrew Richardson and I for Abstergo worked on translations uh, for Abstergo. So, as many of you know, translations are really difficult to do in general, but they're especially hard to difficult on, say, iOS, because there are 32 supported languages in iOS, and so if you have a very robust app or apps that have a lot of strings or things like that, then it's really difficult for you to find people to get it translated and to get it put into the proper file so that you, you can update your tweaks, say. Um, so that's always been on my mind because I have always wanted people all over the world to be able to experience my projects in their native language. And I think that adds a lot of credibility, but also adds a lot of power to them. So now that they can use it in something that they understand. So 
in my past projects, uh, I really hadn't put that much focus on it. But over the last couple, I've, I've really wanted to figure out, okay, how do I, how do I make this easier and better? So I started writing some ideas down and to be quite frank with you, a lot of them were kind of crazy, but a lot of them, um, I wasn't really thinking about the ease of collecting these translations. It was more about like, I needed to find these people and do this and do that. Um, but what I ended up coming to uh, or what I ended up having a conclusion on was how do I how do I make it so that I literally literally have to do very minimal work and just accept the translations and then we can figure out how to trans or put them into bundles or whatever so that the tweet can use them. So Andrew and I were talking and we discovered that actually a really really cool idea would be to do a survey. So we created a Google survey on Drive so that we could you know, send the survey out to anybody online, like via Twitter or Facebook or whatever that might be, and they could actually select which language they were fluent in, and then they would answer all the questions that we had that required them to translate different types of strings or words or phrases in the native language. And as a result of brainstorming this idea, writing these down and really expanding on it, we were actually able to collect all the translations for all 32 iOS languages in less than a week after Abstego release. So that's really, really cool. We were very excited to do that. So don't ever discount your ideas. Write them down and you know give, give yourself some time to think about them and expand on them. Okay, so that's the first step. Make sure you write your ideas down. It's super, super important. The second thing that is really important when you are developing an idea that you want to make into reality is you have to remind yourself that you are the advanced user. Now, what does that even mean? What I mean by advanced user is that because you have the idea, you are in the know on everything, right? Everything you think about in terms of the idea, like how it might work, how it might look, you know that it's going to be that way because you're designing it that way. So that gives you that unfair advantage. So basically what that's saying is what you might think is simple or easy or intuitive might not be because you're not necessarily accounting for everyone that might be using it. So the next step on that is to think about the audience that you are catering to. So in the case of a jailbreak community, you're making said tweaker app, you know, who is your audience? Like what kind of things did they do? What kind of things do they like? What kind of things um, determine the way that they use certain things? So this is very, very hard sometimes to get around because at least for me, you know, I'll sit down on ideas and think about them and go, oh, that, that seems so easy and so intuitive, but you can never really know until you test it out with real people. Because again, you're cheating, right? You already know how something's going to work. Therefore, you th therefore it's obviously easy or obviously simple. So a great example that I like to use is my friends at school. And I use them very often to test random ideas because many of them are not involved in the community at all or even a little bit in comparison to how I am. And so they are a great resource to really test out ideas kind of at a very like normal level. So sometimes I'll go to school and go, hey, check this out, try this out. And sometimes you're like, oh yeah, I like that, that's pretty cool. Um, or they'll be like, oh, I don't get it, that doesn't make any sense. And sometimes I'm like, well, but how, how could that possibly be? It's so easy, it's so intuitive. But remember, again, I'm the advanced user. So think about that. When you're expanding on your idea after you've written them down, think about the idea and don't just think about how you might use it, but maybe expand and think about how other people in your life might use it. And that will kind of give you some insight on more of a holistic perspective when it comes to making this idea like a really successful reality. So write your ideas down, remind yourself that you're the advanced user. The next really important question that I like to ask myself is what problems or what problem am I solving by this idea? So and a, tw a tweak or an app or an idea, they're all anchored to something that you don't like or something that you want to fix, right? And I think that's life. I mean, a lot of things that you pursue are to make things easier or to, or to make things better for others or things like that. There's always a problem that is being solved by doing a tweak, doing an app, whatever, right? So by asking yourself this question, this actually adds some clarity on what you're trying to pursue, like what problem you're actually trying to solve. So the question that I like to ask is, is it really a legitimate problem? And that 
seems obvious, but the reason I ask that question is that sometimes, like in the moment when you're thinking about that, like you might be thinking of this in relation to what you're doing that exact second, but it not, may not really be a real problem, or you might be thinking of it in a different light than like the overall problem. Like that problem might not be specific to general populace. It might just be something that you're thinking about. So thinking in that, res that respect helps you kind of figure out what you're actually trying to target. And then another really great question is, do other people share this problem? And Again, that's really key if you are wanting to you know, create an app or tweak that people use is that if they don't share said problem in the same way, then they're not going to find it useful. And then a really, really good question to ask yourself is does the project or the idea that you have, is it solving the problem that you've discovered in a better and or simpler way? And that's key because if you are looking to solve a problem but make it more complicated, then it's counterintuitive, right? Um, and that's not obviously the intention when you think of those things, but sometimes if you don't really analyze what you're trying to do, you might not really uncover you know, how it actually works and how it really affects the problem you're trying to solve. So as it says at the bottom, the questions are key to uncovering a more holistic perspective, a more 360 degree perspective. And when it comes to the vision of your idea, answering these questions is key too because now you have a drive or, or a sense of direction when it comes to, all right, this is the problem I wanna solve. Like now your your mind is more open to think about other options to to addressing that problem. That kind of go, loops back to writing your ideas down is like, is taking that problem and saying, okay, this is the problem at hand. This is what I wanna solve. Now, how do I do it? And then going back and expanding on it as much as you possibly can so that you find the best or the better solution for something. Because there's never a best solution, right? There's always gonna be something um, better in the future. So if you think about it from a better approach at a time, that opens the door for you to be able to expand on it later once a better idea or a better way comes up. So ask yourself the question, what problems am I solving? It gives you clarity on where you are wanting to go with your idea. And then the next important piece is to sketch out your idea. Now this doesn't have to be super fancy like with mine I have like a, a, a pause gif or something of a project I'm doing but it doesn't have to be that that like you know very specific. It could, you could do it in a Photoshop or an Illustrator if you want to. You could write it on paper. You can do it on a whiteboard. It doesn't even matter. It's just that the visual aspect gives you insight on some possible ways to achieve the idea that you have. And as it says on the slide, it's incredibly important that you have the ability to save what you're drawing or doing. And in the case of what I do, it's really important for a number of reasons. One being that if you're able to save it, you can always refer back to it. And it's a good anchor to remind you yourself of how you did it or, or what kind of or the way that you approached it. And that might help you in the current project or it might help you in another project or another idea you have. So saving is important in that regard, but also... If you're looking to actually make your idea like an actual tweak or an app, which is obviously the purpose of what I'm talking about, you need to be able to show this to potential partners, people that are going to help you make your idea a reality. And that visual aspect gives a lot of credibility to how much work you've put into the idea and how much passion you have for it, but also it makes it clear for, for the partner or whoever you're looking to work with on what you want to do. So... This part actually can be very, very tough um, because this is a lot of like kind of back end work. Like you really want to start just doing your project. Like why am I doing all these sketches? Why am I going through all this stuff? You know, you really just want to start getting the project up and running, right? And that's kind of how I feel sometimes too. But again, another key thing is save every sketch, even though you might hate a sketch or you might not think that sketch is really good, save it anyway because that kind of goes back to what I said just earlier that – you are able to refer back to these designs later and these might give you like a boost in how to pursue another idea or to pursue the current idea or something. You never know. So don't ever throw stuff away. You'd be very surprised with what you're able to come up with by referring to old sketches. So when you're at the whiteboard and you're really drawing stuff out and you're thinking to yourself, man, I really, really, really want to just start this project and get past the stage. Take a deep breath, pause and say, but first, let's take a selfie and pull your phone up and take a, a screenshot because that's that's fun. It's a selfie, right? And you got a picture of your design, so both. And just to add uh, clarity on that, um, 
at JailbreakCon this year, like kind of one of our favorite phrases was, but first let me take a selfie. So if you really want to be a part of the really fun stuff that we do at JailbreakCon, like have funny phrases and take selfies and like really crazy stuff like that, you got to come. It's so much fun. So enough with that, but sketch it out. Sketch it out however you decide to do it, whether it's on the whiteboard or whatever. Sketch it out so you have that visual aspect associated with your idea and now you have something you can show to you the people you might work with to make your idea a reality so the next step after doing all of the above write your ideas down you know ask yourself or, or ask yourself you know what problems am i solving reminding yourself that you're the advanced user and actually sketching it out the next piece is test your hypothesis or test my hypothesis that i'm talking about myself and this is really important too um, because an idea that you have, even when it's sketched out, is really just an hypothesis, right? Like you don't know yet whether what you have written out or the way that you're going to pursue this idea is actually the best solution for your audience, right? And as it says on the slide, an idea is just an idea and you only have one perspective on the matter. And there are many, many more perspectives out there on how this might work or how might this might feel or how this might affect what you're doing. So what I recommend is, is to go out and chat with quote real people, like people out in the real world, like maybe even strangers, maybe even friends, but people that are not tied at all to your project so you can get unbiased feedback about what you're doing and how you are doing it. Um, so I gave the example of Macworld where a couple weeks ago I was in Macworld and I was working on a project and I just went around to random people throughout the conference and asked them questions about what I was working on and I was amazed that not only did it solidify a lot of the stuff I was doing already but it also gave me insight on things that I was doing that might not be a good idea because it just didn't it wasn't catering to what you know people that might use it you know would want to use it for so test your hypothesis and I know it's tough to do sometimes because it might be that you test your hypothesis, say, and it basically dismantles your entire idea. So that makes you have to go all the way back to step one. But don't, but don't take that, don't don't take it hard like that it, that you failed or something like that because it's better to understand more about what you're doing than to pursue it all the way to completion and then realize that what you did was actually not really useful or relevant or even uh, like in the, the eyes and minds of people that you wanted to do your, your stuff. So I think at this point, at this point, I think it goes back to the actual recorded video at JailbreakCon and I'm pretty positive that I actually overlapped some of the stuff I ended up saying in the video, but I just want to say, enjoy the rest of the presentation. If you have any questions or concerns or things you want to talk to me about in regards to this, feel free uh, to hit me up on Twitter. I'm Josh M. Tucker, as it says on my slides, and uh, I'm a very friendly person. I'm not going to bite your head off. Um, I'd be glad to chat with you about any stuff. So, ladies and gentlemen, JailbreakCon 2014, when it actually happened. Pressuring question, like for example, uh, I'm taking a class this semester uh, in marketing research and we're talking about how you do surveys and one of the questions that's very common in surveys that are bad is kind of like pressuring the respondent to feel bad like if they say something wrong. So for example, you might ask a question in a way like, do you think that car seats in cars, you know, you know um, save lives every day, right? It, it's kind of like, if I say no, does that mean like I don't like car seats and I'm, I, don't like, I don't care about children and stuff like that? So just be real careful about the questions you ask. So my example in here is Macworld. I was here two weeks ago for Macworld and I'm working on a project right now that's related to notifications and I actually kind of just like created like this really simple thing where I just kind of like randomly generated like just areas in there uh, in the convention center to find people and ask them questions about my project. And when I collected that real data, it, a lot of it solidified what I was thinking, but also I was like, oh man, I never thought about that. I never thought that that was the perspective that people might have. So test your hypothesis. It will help you a lot. It, it, even if it sends you all the way back to the drawing board, you still have a lot of information compiled. So test your hypothesis. Now all your developers are going to hate me. So next, next part is to compile. And it's not like, you know, make in, in Theos, right? Compile, you, uh, compile this all now together, all your sketches, all your written down things, all your data that you've collected. Compile it into a, into a portfolio. 
And the purpose of this portfolio is to not only be able to keep it for yourself so that you can refer back to it, but also if you're working with other developers or designers, say, they now can have kind of a bundle of what you're looking for. So as it says, it's a snapshot of your project. It's the what, how, and why of what you're going to be doing in the future. And so a good question to ask yourself is, if I compile this bundle, say, and I give it to, you know, I hate snow in the front row, do you think he's going to understand it? Okay, so that's a good question to ask, because if your audience is not able to understand what you're doing, then maybe you need to think a little bit more about what you're doing, right? Because the best way to solidify what you're doing is to be able to describe it in, in easy ways, whether it's in writing or vocally. And obviously the level of depth depends on the size of the project, so don't be tied up about that. So sometimes like if I'm working on really big projects, I'll have like tons of sketches and like tons of screenshots or whatever and documents explaining like some of the features and things like that. Or I might just like have a dribble link or something and I'll send it to somebody and say, hey, check this out. So it just depends on how big the project is. Put it all together, create that bundle. So the next couple of slides are kind of focused around if you're someone like me who finds people to help bring my ideas to reality. So this is great for anybody that might be curious uh, to how they might be able to get started in getting some of the things they love or things that they want done. So it seems pretty obvious, but find the best people. Like, don't just settle for like someone. Find that person that you really connect with beyond the project. Find someone that is really good and what they do and maybe in that area of where you want to do your project. And I put up here that the partnership is less important than the friendship. And the, and the reason I say that is because just in my own experience anyway, like I've always approached my projects as a friendship. Like I never said like, hey, we'll just do this project together and get it done or whatever. I was like, hey, let's be friends. I want to know more about you. I like, want to know what you do, what you love, that kind of stuff. And you find that the more and more that you connect on other levels, there's greater mutuality between the project that you're pursuing. And the chemistry between the people in the project can really seriously make or break your project. So build trust. It sets you up for success in the future. It allows you to think differently, to, to really get things done, to set goals, and to, and to shoot for the stars, if you will. So after all that piece, obviously you have to pitch the idea somewhere, right? So I have a beer, pitch the idea, and extend the invitation. And kind of like um, I think Britta was talking about yesterday, be open to feedback. So don't get all mad like, oh, you hate my project, that kind of thing, right? Be open to feedback because, again, this is, this is another way for you to gather that data to see if your project's really, really legit, right? Um, and then if you're actually going to pursue the project with said person, designer, developer, whatever, make sure you set up your expectations up front so that you're both held accountable for the job that you're going to be fulfilling. And then start. Yeah. That's, that's always a, a really fun part. So now that you've started your project, now that you've actually, you know, had the wheels turning, okay, the next piece is ensure that you are setting the proper goals that you need to be setting and that you're stressing the importance of communication within the project. So some of the things up here are some of the ways that I help myself and the people I work with stay on task. So the first one is I actually schedule calendar events for project meetings. So some of those people in this corner over here might know that, and they're probably like, that's so annoying. But I find it really important because I'm really busy and they're really busy, but if we have it on the same calendar and we get an alert, um, it, that's really important. And for me who works with people all over the world, sometimes that alert is like 1 a.m., 3 a.m., you know, 6 a.m., that kind of thing, so that's important. Uh, another thing I like to do is just kind of like look at each other's schedules, whether it's in time zone related or like school related or whatever, and like kind of find a day that you kind of share mutually. And then that, call that kind of like a check-in day, like make that the time to be like, hey, here's what I've got. Oh, hey, here's what I've got and, and see kind of where they meet. And again, that consistent schedule that you have will keep you on task and help you achieve your project in a better way. Um, and then it says up there, communication breaks down walls. Um, what I mean by that is it's very easy to approach a project and say, I'm designer, you're developer, right? But what I found to be the best is when you treat 
everyone in the, in, in the group equally. Like, yeah, that's a title that you might have, but that doesn't necessarily distinguish whether you can make comments about how it should be developed or how it should be designed. Because there's, again, sometimes where I'm thinking one thing and someone else is thinking another thing, and then we come to a consensus and say, wow, actually, that's not really what we were thinking. We want to do it this way. So communication allows you to be able to pull in from many different sources, and that will help you make a more robust, more full project. Um, and again, the relationship to me anyway is more important than the project because no matter what the project becomes in the future, you set yourself up for success for potentially continuing future project opportunities with that person or maybe you learn something new. So treat every piece of your project as a learning experience and maybe even write it down even, okay? So set goals and stress communication. Now, Sebastian talked yesterday about uh, just some ideas about how to like market your tweaks, right? So that's something that I am very key on, and that's why this point here is very important to me, and I think it's really important for everybody, is create your quote blogger bundle. And you can use that phrase if you want. I just made it up today, okay? Create your blogger bundle, okay? And in that bundle is a lot of different things. Um, and so as I mentioned, uh, you know, Sebastian talked about it. So again, it kind of relates back to your portfolio even. You know, can the reviewer that you're giving the, the bundle to, can they understand what you're doing? Like, do they understand the city description? Do they understand, like, the, you know, the tweak itself? And it's important to be really, really specific because sometimes you have maybe, like, really expansive projects and you want every detail to be highlighted, but because it's so robust, which is not a bad thing, they might, you know, miss over something. So make sure you describe every piece that you want them to see and want them to highlight, say, in the review. Um, so the kind of documentation that I like to use is obviously like a city description type thing, uh, screenshots, even a video sometimes. And there's obviously some people that still do their own thing, like say I download a blog with their videos and that sort of thing. But remember that the bundle, if you create it universally, then you don't have to continually keep compiling it all the time and sending it to people. So you can always have it if someone asks, you say, hey, boom. So that, that could also include the dev file or any files, say as a theme, that kind of thing. Uh, so yesterday, Sebastian talked about an idea about keeping all of the developer, or excuse me, the reviewers that you have kind of in your repertoire, like have their city ideas, city IDs, so you can give it to them directly and tell them. Something that I do that's really helped me a lot is I actually created like a city ID spreadsheet, and it has a couple things on it. It has the person's name, um, it has their Twitter handle if they have one, it has you know what their organization is, you know, I more, I download blog, my my, whatever, right? Um, and then it has their city ID, and then any other Im important information. So I always have that, so I never have to go looking for it. I can always just refer to that sheet, so email, all that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, so screenshots and et cetera. So create your blogger bundle. And then, ladies and gentlemen, once you have pursued this all the way to the end, you've done all the writing down, you've done all the sketching, you've found the best, you approached this, you set your goals, then, ladies and gentlemen, you can release. Oh. Boom. And for those of you on the blog, blog sorry, uh, I dropped an anvil, so, okay. Uh, <laughs> two, in fact. So <laughs> the next part is release. And now it seems like, yay, it's all over. You know, I can you know, pop the bottle of champagne and be done. No, no, no. So this is actually a really, really crucial part. So <laughs> it seems obvious. But make sure when you are releasing your, your package, make sure you're around. Make sure that like, you're available to answer questions, that you're able to you know, kind of work with your customers, if you will. So a good thing to do is schedule with your repository manager. I know that Kyle does it really well. He's awesome. Optima does it really well, too. Build that relationship. Again, leverage those relationships. Those will help you in the long run. So another piece is engage with people. So be genuine when you're talking to people. Again, this is another opportunity for you to gain user feedback. Like, oh, I really don't like that, or oh, I love that. And maybe the comments that you get from the release of your project will help you with other projects, or this project, or whatever that might be. Um, so yeah, user feedback. And then really establish a connection with your users. Um, I found that when you treat people like human beings, like they're, they're humans on the other side, they respect you. And then you you know, we, we, you get the respect too. So mutual respect is really important. And again, it's a great help for future projects. Um, they might give you insight on something. You might learn something from them. They might ask questions. They might present you a perspective that you've never seen before. So be, be open-minded to that. 
So when you release, make sure you're around, make sure that you're really engaging with your users, that you really care about what they're saying and their problems and all that stuff. So you've released everything, now it's all over, but this kind of cycle repeats itself, right? Because now you've released and now you've got you know, updates for your packages. So I recommend that these tips are really good for you know, updates, for like releasing a lot of different stuff. And I, and I tried my best to make it as universal as possible for themers, for developers, et cetera. So I'm gonna leave you with this and I suppose if you have any questions, I left time for it uh, in my presentation, but I wanna leave you with this quote that I really love and I think it's really good. And it says, action is the foundational key to all success. And that was by uh, Pablo uh, Picasso. And I, and I really truly believe in that. You know, you might think that, oh, I, I don't know how to code or I don't know how to design. Well, do it, just go, go out there, just start it. You, you, you will never be truly successful if you don't fail a little bit, learn from your failures. You know, you, you'll never be successful if you don't do it. So if you've been thinking maybe on the border to maybe like wanting to start to code or to start to design or to start, you know, anything, just, just do it. Just go out there and do it. You can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. So that's my presentation. So I have no idea. Oh, I guess I'm okay. Is any, do I have enough time, Britta? Do I have enough time for a couple questions maybe? I know that it's not really. I do. I kind of did it on purpose. Cool. For, but first, let's take a selfie. <laughs> Oh, do you have a, okay, does anyone have any, like, just really quick questions? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Can I, um, here, hold on, I'm going to mute the mic real quick. Okay, back. In black. No, I'm not, but, okay. You mentioned a lot about, you know, uh, saving a lot of your work, and, you know, you might be doing it in one application or software. Um, what type of tools would you say you use to like separate the differences from <laughs> all the different versions of you know PDFs and all that stuff that you have compiled? Okay, great question. Um, I have a friend uh, that gave me the suggestion. It's really easy, and I really love it. It's so simple. All I do basically is I I create a folder for said project, Callbar, right? I'll just use Callbar as an example. So I have a call bar folder in whatever like projects folder I have. And then inside of the call bar folder, I might have some like just general stuff, but then I'll folder every version. So say like I'm working on version one right now, I'll create a folder, version one, right? And every kind of screenshots, every kind of like, you know, whatever I use goes into that folder. And then let's say I'm going on to version two, I can either carry that over and change it and then save it into a version two folder or like I can start from scratch. So I, it's really nothing super like special. It just using folders to separate just your versions. Because it's easy for me anyway, just like open a PSD and you can kind of see. And another great thing too is if you know you're changing thing in versions, you can write it down like say in a, in a text editing document and put it in the folder just so you know like what you did and like how you approached it. And then you can compare notes say between uh, versions of whatever you're doing. Did I answer your question? Yes, Tim. Hey. Great, great talk, by the way. Thank you. This guy has all the energy. Um, I have a quick question because I honestly, uh, until recently, didn't understand exactly what you did, that you're a, an idea guy. Mm -hmm. And um, so I have a couple of questions. How open are the developers to taking the ideas that you have? Because I would assume, I mean, even a lot of the really, really um, great coders and things that are in the room or, or, or the ones that aren't, might not have that UX, you know, the user experience background and that, you know, part of their brain functioning like you do. So do they, are they very open for that and really, um, you know, like working? And are, and are there any other people that you know of that are doing it to the level that you are? Right, absolutely, it's a, that's a really great question. So that kind of highlights with finding the best and how I personally leverage friendship for the partnership aspect, not like to say that it's kind of an end, you know, a means to an end, right? But I have established credibility, say, with people, and so as much as I trust them in their ability to code, they are trusting me in my ability to make decisions that are 
great for the, the design perspective. Um, and again, that communication breaks down barriers type thing too, is if you don't treat them like they're siloed in this box, then they feel like they're open to making suggestions. So it's not that I'm the designer idea slash whatever you call me, and that person said developer or what compiler or whatever, right? We are just, our, our expertise is in that area, but we're working together to meet the same goal. Um, and so people that are really good at that uh, are people like Sentry and uh, Cernex, who's going to be talking today. Those are really great examples of people that have leveraged that also and people that I greatly respect for what they do. Does that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. And I just wanted to make a point I think that goes along with, um, I think for me at least, because I don't have any coding experience, but may have had some good ideas, it's nice to know, you know that there is that outlet that's out there because I, think, I, I would assume that a lot of uh, developers you know, might might struggle with coming up with that creative side and may have an excellent idea, but not not the know-how, you know, that someone like you might. So that's a great, uh, for know, the general great. public to know that, hey, if you have a great idea, you don't have to be a master coder. You can literally partner with somebody. Well, and it's great, too, because that friendship aspect is awesome, because even if you don't work with said person, they're not going to, like, steal your idea, which is not very common, I don't think, anyway. But, you know, someone like Cyril or, uh, or Ryan, I pitch ideas with him all the time. In fact, I pitched an idea with Cyril when he was here in Texas last week. And I told him, and he was just like, no, that's not gonna work. Like, that's impossible. <laughs> Who do you think you are, right? Um, so that friendship that you build allows you to get that feedback in a more genuine, uh, in a more genuine way. And uh, uh, to your point about having an idea and approaching a developer too, again, it comes with that mutual respect aspect. Because you come to them and say, hey, I've got this really cool idea. It's gonna do like one thing and I want 50%. Like, no, right? So you have to establish that you're going to, quote, pull your weight. Because an idea is important, right? It obviously has value. But you, you have to demonstrate to them that you're providing them value, too. Like, what's your value proposition? So like, what I usually like to do is if I have an idea and they're kind of skeptical at first, I was like, look, here's what I do. So I do the design aspect. I do any of the creation aspect, any of the marketing. I have all the connections with people for blogging and all that stuff. And then it kind of goes, oh, okay, I'm just coding, and that's not really the case, but oh, okay, so I'm not like, now I'm not juggling all these different things now because Josh is taking care of it, right? So establishing that credibility will open more doors for you actually making your ideas into reality. Any other questions? Cool. Yeah, I think we're good. Thank, Thank you, you Josh. Everybody.